Hi, my name is Patrick Morrissey and I'm a catchment scientist in the EPA catchments unit and I'm going to talk to you today about modelling karst hydraulics and hydrology. So why would we model groundwater flooding in karst or why would we try to model karst hydrogeology or the movement of, of groundwater in a karst situation? I suppose for the first reason, it's an interesting scientific challenge to, to model this. It's, they're, they're not easy systems to model. They're difficult and it can pre present quite a, a task to, to modelers to, to try and get a, a, a model that represents these systems accurately. Um, but from a practical point of view, often, um, Internationally, the main reason people are trying to model these systems is because you see in this uh, cross section here, if you have a, a spring and people are trying to quantify the either the, the quantity or the quality of, of water that can be abstracted from a spring, say it might be a potable water supply, you need to be able to get a handle on the, on the recharge area, the catchment, and uh, use a model to be able to make some estimations of the yield and issues of quality and, and recharge etc so that's a practical application of why we need to maybe be able to model a car system and um, there's also issues in terms of trying to quantify source protection areas maybe for that if there's pressures in the catchment and we and you can see here areas where there might be point infiltration or diffuse infiltration. If you're trying to delineate a source protection area for that spring, um, you'd need to, you'd, you'd be well placed to have a, a model to be able to do that for you. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is mainly about modeling the, a car system like this, but in terms of groundwater flooding. So you can see here is a aerial imagery of the flooding that groundwater flooding that took place in the Gort Lowlands catchment, which is a catchment dominated by karst hydrogeology. Um, and this is the flooding that took place in the winter of 2015 into 2016. And this aerial photography is focused on an area called Kiltartan. And you can see large scades of land um, completely inundated with water. Um, and in fact, at its peak, there was almost 24 kilometers squared of land in, inundated for nearly six months across the catchment. And that's one of the things that makes this type of karst groundwater flooding uh, quite unique is that it, the length of time, it persists for quite a long time. And that could cause a particularly big problem and issue for, for landowners and, and residents in the area. Um, but you can see here, these houses here are completely cut off for quite a long time. You can see this church here in Kiltaran flooded. And you can actually see in the background across here, this is the M18. Um, and you can see parts of it were actually flooded during construction. Um, and I guess this is the, the main reason why we, why I needed to be involved in developing um, a karst model of of groundwater flooding um, for for this catchment, um, and it's obviously a quite a, a good application if you have a, a model of karst to be able to use it for this type of an issue. So, just a little bit of background for anyone who's not familiar about groundwater flooding in in Irish karst. So, it's mainly focused around turlocks, and um, we have the textbook de definition of what a turlock here is. Um, topographic depressions of karst, they intermittently flood um, for groundwater sources and they have ecology that is characteristic of wetlands. So they're actually a wetland, a type of a wetland, turlocks are, even though they can be dry for six or more months of the year. And you can see here there's various different schematics that turlocks themselves are not straightforward. They're not, um, they're, they're, they're not uniform, they're heterogeneous, they, they all behave differently. Um, and we can group them into different types of categories, but it, even within those categories, they behave differently, which makes trying to develop a model of them quite complicated. But you can see here that we have uh, turlocks that maybe ha might have a river input and then they discharge completely to groundwater, or they might behave more like a surcharge tank where you have a depression 
in the ground and really it's just the the head is causing the water the groundwater to rise up in in that depression and it's just and that's in that sense it's their expression of the groundwater table um, and then we have flow through turlocks or localized flow and this is not an exhaustive list there are many other different types of turlocks um, but just getting across an idea here that it's not it's not straightforward and each all turlocks are different so when you've got a catchment that has um, multiple different types of turlocks in it it gets uh, exponentially more complicated in trying to develop a model for it so again just you know, I, maybe you're all quite aware but just for anyone who's not a refresher um, about how turlocks operate and how they behave so I've shown here on the left is area of photography of two turlocks in the Gort Lowlands catchment, Black Rock and Loch Coy. You can see this is in summer and Black Rock is completely dry. And um, this is one of the main uh, sinks or, or swallow holes in the, in the turlock. And you can see Loch Coy is quite low, uh, although that does usually have a permanent water level in its base um, all year round. And you can see here that during the, during the summer, it's commonage land and it's... Um, it's completely dry and then in in the winter you can see in the aerial and um, that there's uh, widespread extent of flooding there at both locations and you can see here that all that land in, that you can see in the image above is completely flooded and actually it's quite traumatic in a few days this can fill to nearly 12 meters depth down here in the middle so um it can be quite traumatic uh, in terms of the the way that groundwater flooding happens in these types of catchments so a little bit about karst hydrogeology. Um, so the, the, the directions of individual passageways or, or uh, conduits or caves or whatever, um, fractures, however you want to refer to them, is mainly controlled by the, the structures and the distribution of the phreatic and vado zones so, and, and flow. And the nature of the groundwater recharge is, is very important if you're trying to develop a hydraulic model of the system. And we, we have two different classic types of catchment where you might have an autogenic um, catchment where its recharge is from diffuse sources across the catchment, or you might have an allogenic catchment where you have water flowing in from point sources um, and from maybe neighboring catchments. Um, but usually we'll have this kind of mixed uh, arrangement where we have a mixture of point sources and diffuse sources um, and that's important when it comes to trying to develop a hydraulic model because sometimes if you have rivers or point sources you've got elements of fluvial hydrology and fluvial modeling that might need to come into it to augment your uh, groundwater flow model in the karst area so it's, it can get quite complicated. So if we're trying to um, Imagine the flow of groundwater in through the karst bedrock. We consider the triple porosity model. So we have three different kind of elements of flow that take place in the bedrock, um, and they're summarized here. So we have the matrix permeability, so the kind of uh, the matrix storage in the bedrock. We have fracture permeability, um, whereas different joints and bedding planes sometimes enlarged by solution and then we have conduits which are basically large uh, passageways or caves um, and they well they can go from very small apertures up to up to very very large um, tens of meters in in diameter sometimes and obviously the permeability uh, of these is is very very different and how you would model them and how water flows through them hydraulically is 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 very different so if you if we look here at some of the different um equations or uh, empirical ways that we use to to uh, try and quantify the flow of water through these different uh porosity mediums and we have to look at them in different ways so in terms of the matrix flow um darcy's law has is is used to model that um in terms of the fracture flow, um, we use the cubic law and, and some of the models that are out there will use these different equations. And then in terms of the conduit flow, we can use darcy Weirach equation. And you can see that it's, it's not, it's not uh, straightforward. There's, there's these different elements that have to be taken into account 
terms of the way that water flows and particularly in the conduit flow because you get different types of flow laminar flow or tur turbulent flow um, and that affects uh, empirically how we're going to actually um, represent that in an American model. So if we want to, for modeling karst, there are essentially three different approaches that, that are, are taken. Um, the first is using lumped or reservoir models. And I have an example here of a simple uh, reservoir model that was developed for, I guess, more of a European climate upland karst where uh, taking into account that you get kind of snow storage of water during the winter period. But essentially it's, you have different reservoirs rent, uh, representing the different elements of flow, whether you've got fast flow or slow flow, you've got storage from the epicarst, or in this case there's storage from snow. And then that's all um, discharging into the under, underground karst network. Um, so this is, this is a, a simple example of a lumped or reservoir model. Then we have semi-distributed models. So these are models that try to take in some element of the spatial distribution of the, of the catchment in terms of how things vary across the catchment. But it doesn't um, necessarily take into the account the full the full spatial extent of, of how things vary across the catchment. And it does simplify certain elements of it, like on the previous example, um, a very simple res representations of reservoirs, whatever it might be. So you could see we're getting into a little bit more detail, but it's still not fully, uh, fully uh, representative of the whole catchment. Then you have distributed models, uh, which are spatially, distributed across the entire catchment in terms of all the different uh, inputs there might be, whether it's uh, soils and subsoils or rainfall as it varies across catchment or ET across the catchment for transpiration or, um, and how the, the bedrock and everything changes across the catchment. So it's a fully distributed model. And these different types of models have different, uh, they compare differently and they're, they're, they have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, so I've just tried to simply represent that here in terms of accuracy. A lumped or reservoir model would probably be the least accurate um, and the distributed models would, would tend to be the most accurate. But when it comes to effort and speed and setting up and calibrating these models, a lumped or reservoir model is much uh, simpler and faster to implement and it requires a lot less data. So if you want to get to developing a distributed model of a catchment, you need a lot of data. It will take a lot of a lot more effort and it will take a lot longer, but you will get a lot more accuracy out of it. So at the beginning, when you decide if you want to develop the model, you need to take this into account. Um, and by far, I suppose lumped uh, models are, are, are probably the most predominant type of model used in modeling karst um, because they oftentimes you won't have the data you need um, or you won't have the, the time or effort needed to, to put into calibrating or setting up a more complicated model. But it's, it's important at the beginning that you, you, you define what, what the level of precision you need is and what data you have available before you can actually make the decision what model you, modeling approach you'll take. So I'm going to talk and take you through the example of the Gort Lowlands and the different various data inputs that we needed, that I needed to, to build a model and the issues with precision and accuracy and some of the um, ecological considerations that had to go into that um, and, and the applications and of the model that can, it can be used for those purposes. So this is the, the Gort Lowlands. Um, we have this kind of upland or mountainous area to the east of the catchment, which is old red sandstone. And then we have the lowlands, which is a uh, limestone, karst, karstified limestone. And then we have the whole catchment discharging to Kinvara Bay over in the uh, northwest. And the catchment is, it receives, Allogenic recharge from 
three catchments in the mountains. Um, these three rivers flow down off the all red sandstone onto the limestone and then disappear underground uh, into the carcified bedrock. There's autogenic recharge occurring across the catchment and there are lots of point sources and diffuse sources for the autogenic recharge. Um, the, the catchment is, is full of sinkholes and swallow holes and karst features. Um, and the whole catchment discharges to Convara Bay via a series of intertidal springs. Um, so it's not actually possible to measure the uh, the flow, the quantity of discharge at the outlet because it's uh, cyclically uh, underwater. So where would you even start developing a model for, for this catchment um, hydraulic model? Well, first of all, you need to consider what the various different inputs in terms of if you're looking at a water balance, what the inputs are. Um, so we have, we have rivers, as I said, there's three rivers flowing in, providing uh, allogenic recharge to the catchment. Uh, three, uh, uh, three of them are uh, quite large rivers and there's a smaller one uh, flowing from the kind of southwest. Um, and there's issues there in terms of do you have the data, do you have the flow discharge data in those rivers and if so, uh, yeah, or if not, do we need do you need a model? Do you need to model that data? To, but you're back into fluvial models then. Um, then there's the, the turlocks. There's uh, numerous turlocks, floodplains across the catchment. And do, do you have the uh, record of the stage uh, or volumes across the catchment uh, over time? Are there any boreholes? Is there any use, useful information there? Do we have rainfall? evapotranspiration and then it's it's the whole catchment is bounded by and, and discharges to the sea so you have any data on the tide. So there are many different data sources and there's issues with the availability of data and the scale or provision or precision of that data. Um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail I think a little later but there's also issues in terms of continuity of the data because there, there there's always issues in terms of logger malfunctions or breakdowns and then there's there's times when data isn't reliable and um, so that all leads to sources of error and confidence in the or ranges of uncertainty in the outputs from the model and it's, it's important sometimes I think to define this at the beginning when you're starting out to develop a model what accuracy or what precision do we need what's our confidence that we need in it and um, how much uncertainty are we willing to live with? Because trying to develop these models, a lot of times um, that will kind of dictate the effort and the time that you need to put into the, the model uh, development and the model validation. So I've just shown you here um, the GSI records for the area um, the black lines are various different traces that have been done over the years and you can see all the turlocks and caves and the karst features across the catchment this is a portion of the catchment here the main portion around kind of cool turlock which is kind of the center point of the catchment and um, so when you start out looking at something like this and trying to come up with a model to represent it a hydraulic model is it can be quite daunting and um, so the best thing to do is start simple and come up with a conceptual model of the catchment. And again, even trying to come up with a conceptual model of this catchment is quite difficult. So best way to go about that when that even something simple like that is a problem is to uh, start small and then try and build up the, pic the, the picture like pieces of jigsaw until you get to your final kind of overall conceptual model. And then you can start worrying about how you're going to represent that in a numerical model. So here's some of the types of um, smaller conceptual models that were, were um, that I developed to try and build up to the overall bigger model. Um, so I showed you that example earlier of Black Rock and Koi. You can see that 
Black Rock has a river input, so it's Turlock with a river input that discharges or uh, drains to, to the karst bedrock. And it, it has Loch Coy on there, but that has permanent water. And then we, it flows over into a Valley Lee floodplain. We have kind of this overland flood route that develops when there's extreme flooding. So trying to conceptualize what happens uh, in terms of if, if the water level backs up and block Black Rock, there must be some kind of constriction or um, something that limits the amount of outflow there in the bedrock. Um, given that Koi has water in it, all of the time um, and it doesn't really overflow there must be some kind of ability to back bypass it but there also is some kind of limit or throttle to keep the water backed up in the other two turlocks and um, we know that there's a high level overflow swallow hole that we can see on the ground and then we know then that another river comes in the body Cahillan, and there's this body leaf floodplain that connects up to black rock when it's when it's uh they're both in flood. So you kind of start to try and draw pictures like this conceptually, how this whole system operates. Here's another one further down the system where the Gort River flows into the Castletown Sink, and we have this floodplain. Then there's all sorts of culverts that limit overland flow. And um, there's a railway line with an embankment that again acts like a dam. Um, and then that all goes under the N18 road, which again has a, a, a culvert underneath it which kind of throttles overland flow in this area and it all feeds into to create the heads the hydraulic heads and the pressures in the system given that it's a, a conduit system so developing these types of simple conceptual models allow you to build up to uh, introduce other techniques to make the the model more complicated we could say okay let's take our tracing data let's take this or let's take um, stage measurements that we have over time in Black Rock and Koi and look at how the water rises and falls over time together. Um, we can do some kind of correlation analysis on that. If we want to get into more detail, we can get into time series analysis and see how there are wavelets, wavelet analysis, see again the relationships and test them. And as I said, this kind of comes into the accuracy you're required. Um, how much detail do you want to get bogged down in in terms of this type of wavelet analysis, time series analysis? Maybe you'll get to it and you'll say, actually, we need to do more tracing on the ground. We need to figure out, is that connected to that or not? Um, and all of that is hopefully leading to, to this kind of conceptual flow model where we know what's connected, where there are conduits, roughly, um, and how they're connected, how the epicarst interacts. Um, then for our data inputs for our rivers, you you get this kind of time series data for discharge data in the rivers. And then we have these gaps um, where the loggers weren't available or the, the flow maxed out, the logger couldn't handle it. So then we need to develop uh, rainfall runoff models for the fluvial uh, inputs to be able to quantify those inflows. Again, what's the scale and precision? Do we need hourly, daily discharge? For the turlocks, daily is probably sufficient. Uh, for the rivers to capture the peak events, daily is probably not sufficient. So you need to, again, it goes back to how accurate you need your output to be. And then for the data inputs for the Turlocks, we have, we have, we were lucky enough that we have over, a lot of research projects that happen over the years in Trinity College Dublin. There's long time series data for five of the main Turlocks in the catchment, but you can see that there are gaps in the data um, in many locations, particularly here, when there was a big flood in 2009, we didn't get this peak. Um, so how do we fill in those gaps? Then there are 10 or more other locations, Turlocks throughout the catchment, we've no data for at all. Uh, so then there was this project for the GSI, the G GW flood, where they put out lots of loggers for a two year period where we, we could capture some of that data at those locations. And then where we didn't have other data, able to, GSI developed this, um, tool where you can look at sentinel satellite data over time and use it to build up a, a hydrograph of the that's like if you had a logger in the turlock itself and um, we can use that data as well to fill in some of these gaps or for areas where we don't have uh, data and um, so that's quantifying your input for your turlocks then rainfall we had rain gauges in the catchment again it's an issue of scale 
is one rain gauge accurate enough for a 500 kilometer square catchment? Do you need more? Again, it's that whole spatial um, element and whether you want a semi-distributed, fully distributed or lumped model and um, where we're lumping everything in together. And then we have the tide at the, at the boundary condition where we can get that data as well. Um, then we need to bring in topography into it. We have uh, LiDAR data so we can accurately represent these the Turlock basins and get the stage volume relationship, but at where they're permanently flooded, like Cool and 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 Koi, to get data from um, bathymetric surveys and combine it with the lidar, so we could produce these accurate stage volume relationships and use that data as well to populate two D models. So you can see a, a mesh here for a two D model. And then I suppose the nuts and bolts of actually developing the model and conceptualizing and bringing that conceptual model into a numerical model and something that we can we can do numbers numerical stuff on it and get and get answers out of it. So kind of representing turlocks as ponds with that stage volume relationship I showed before and using a pipe network to represent conduits and these kind of smaller pipes as throttles to control the, the stage in the different ponds. And then using uh, input of reservoir models to represent the storage in the soil and the, the matrix or the epicarst and how that discharges then into the pipe network. And again, do you need a fully distributed model? Do you need to be able to take into account um, everything across the catchment or can you, can you do, so we ended up with a, the model I developed ended up being a semi-distributed model where we, we take into account some of it and then some of it's lumped together. But again, this is, it all comes back to the precision or the accuracy you need from this at the, at the, at the end. And you can see then after all of that model development, able to develop um, quite an accurate representation of the flooding that was happening in these various different turlocks. Um, you can see kind of the observed versus predicted from the model. It's quite accurate. Um, and then taking that to the next step, applying that model um, to calculate extreme flood statistics and um, bringing in uh, weather generators and re using rainfall uh, records that we have. And I think Owen obviously talked beforehand about this and who's involved in this element of it to try and create uh, synthetic rainfall uh, because we don't really know how these turlocks react or what a one in a hundred year flood is for a turlock. So we have to synthesize data to be able to produce that. And once we have a calibrated model, you can feed all that data in and, and, and do your kind of annual max series analysis like you would for a fluvial system. But it gets more complicated in groundwater, as I said earlier, because groundwater tends to persist for a long time. So the flood duration is also an issue. So you can produce... Um, exceedances for different return periods for when it comes to flooded duration as well. It's another aspect you have to consider when it's when it comes to karst groundwater flooding. Um, and then trying to quantify the overland flow discharges. Again, this is a mixed model. We've got fluvial flow in there, we've got groundwater flow, and then you've got these kind of overflows that turn into overland flow on the land. And that's an important part because that's what affects um, most, I guess, the, the landowners and, and um, the, that's the biggest impact from flooding in that catchment. So all of that work is complete and you can view all the maps that came out of that um, on the uh, GSI Groundwater Flood Map Viewer on their website. You can see some of the output here uh, on the screenshot. So practically applying that model then, um, this is where it gets interesting. There was a flood alleviation project for the catchment, I guess, which is still going on. This is some some simple early work uh, that I did as part of the research project with Trinity where you can kind of conceptually add in overland uh, channels and you can see the impacts of, of trying to lower the flood level at the different key points across the catchment and what these channel dimensions would need to be. But all the while then you need to keep an eye to your ecological considerations because if you're bringing extra fresh water down to the to the, the bay, the outlet, it can var overland a lot faster than we'll get there via ground. There's issues with the um, fresh water uh, in the bay and how it would impact WFD protected shellfish protected areas and aquaculture in the bay. Um, so again, you can use the model for these types of ecological issues 
um, or practical applications to, to test the implications. And then there's the impact to groundwater dependent uh, habitats. Um, a lot of these turlocks are SACs and you could see the different areas in the perimeter around these uh, turlocks um, and how the different frequencies of flooding creates these um, habitats. And what are the impacts of flood alleviation schemes drawing these out? Um, what are the impacts to uh, the habitats? Priority, these are priority habitats. Um, and are we going to change the flooding regime or the flood durations? And you can use the model, the hydraulic model, once you have it calibrated, to test these types of questions. And then there's the whole issue of the forestry in the upland area, where, which is providing allergenic recharge to the catchment. And how is that impacting on flows and quantity of flows in the lowlands? And again, you can use your rainfall runoff models for the rivers, and you can use then your karst groundwater model to apply it and even bring in elements like water quality and, and time of travel and uh, residence time, etc., into it. So um, kind of a whistle stop tour there. Um, and I guess just trying to emphasize the various different um, in, uh, applications. Finally, I suppose climate change, what are the implica implications of, of climate change? And the final part of the work um, that was done using this model was to try and bring in the various different um, climate models. And these are um, downscaled uh, global climate models into regional climate models um, to bring in this kind of high resolution gridded data to investigate what will happen in the future of climate change from a flood alleviation scheme or even just from an ecological perspective in terms of how are the habitats going to change and um, do we need to intervene or should we intervene and we can look at the the different RCPs for the future and how they'll uh, how they'll be impacted and again you can see this is a, a climate change map a future climate change map predicted for the future and again you can view that on the GSI website if you want so I know I've gone through this, this quite quickly, but just trying to show the key points um, on how you would develop these types of hydraulic models in Karst and um, the, the, some of the considerations that have to be taken into account. And I guess it's all down to the accuracy and what you're looking for at the end of it. Um, and then trying to show some of the applications for such a model once you have it uh, calibrated and validated. So thank you.